Today's lesson is on the mechanisms of evolution other than natural selection. Keep in mind that the word mechanism just means a way in which something happens. Today's objective is Objective 2.44b. I can describe mechanisms of evolution other than natural selection, and I can explain how evolution occurs at a population level with genes as the raw material. Natural selection explains how organisms adapt over time to their environments and how variations can give rise to adaptations within species. However, natural selection is not the only mechanism of evolution. By studying population genetics, we have learned more about evolutionary theory. We need to understand how evolution occurs at the population level, um, meaning with lots of organisms, with the genes as the raw material, meaning that genetic variation is needed in a population in order for evolution to take place. Before we get to different mechanisms, first we need to go back to our genes. Remember that an allele is just one form of a trait that you can get from a parent. We have two alleles from, for every single trait, one from mom and one from dad for a total of two. Remember that we've got dominant alleles, as shown by capital letters, and we've got recessive alleles, as shown by lowercase letters. However, even after Mendel figured out all of this, early evolutionary theory scientists were still really confused as to why dominant alleles didn't just completely take over recessive alleles so that no recessive alleles were left over in a population. In other words, they were curious as to how recessive alleles survive over the generations. So the question is, why don't dominant alleles completely take over recessive alleles? In 1908, a mathematician, Godfrey Hardy, and a physician, Wilhelm Weinberg, uh, came up with the solution, both came up with the solution to this problem at the same exact time. They both showed that mathematically, evolution will not occur in a population unless the allelic frequencies are acted upon by other forces that cause it to change. For those of you that don't know, an allelic frequency is just how often alleles occur within a population. So in the absence of these outside forces, these allelic frequencies always remain the same and evolution obviously doesn't occur. This is called genetic equilibrium. And this is why recessive alleles will stay in a population at the same frequency that they, have always, ha that they always have. Think about the fact that human, the human population still has individuals who are albino, even though albinism is a recessive trait. So this is called the Hardy-Weinberg uh, principle. When allelic frequencies remain constant, the population is in genetic equilibrium. For example, let's imagine that we have a population of three Watsits. We've got two red Watsits and one green Watsits. So our, um, our ratio is two to one. If they have more children, you'll notice that the next generation has four red Watsits and two green Watsits, or a ratio of four to two. Now four to two can also be reduced to two to one, which, hey, that's exactly the same as my parent generation. This is genetic equilibrium, meaning everything just stays the same. According to the Hardy-Weinberg principle, a population in genetic equilibrium has to meet five different conditions. One, there must be a population large enough that there is no genetic drift. Two, there should be no gene flow, meaning that individuals shouldn't leave or enter a population. Three, there should be no mutation, meaning that the DNA should stay exactly the same. 4. Mating must be completely random, and 5. There must be no natural selection. You can imagine how hard it is for any population to meet these conditions, even for a short amount of time. If a population is not in genetic equilibrium, then at least one of these five conditions has been violated. The violations of the five conditions of, Hardy, of the Hardy-Weinberg principle of genetic equilibrium are called the mechanisms of evolution. Uh, the five of them are genetic drift, gene flow, mutation, non-random mating, and natural selection. Of these, only natural selection actually is thought to provide adapted advantages to a population, and only natural selection acts on an organism's phenotype. The rest of these are actually just due to complete chance, and we're going to see how those work today. Genetic drift is any change in allelic frequencies in a population that is due to chance. Genetic drift is more likely to happen in smaller populations, which is why the Hardy-Weinberg principle requires a large population. There are two ways in which a population can become small enough for genetic drift to occur. The first is called the founder effect, uh, and is when a small population settles in a, large, in a location separated from the rest of the population. Because it is such a small selection of what the rest of the population was, they might, in have, they might in fact have a great difference in allelic frequencies than the rest of the population. You can see here that on island 1, we have 50% blue Wichita columns and 50% pink Wichita columns. 
If some of these individuals travel across the ocean to the next island, you'll see that you have a smaller population. This smaller population will reproduce over time, as you can see. Therefore, many generations later, Island 2 may end up with 33% whatchamacallums and 67% pink whatchamacallums, which is very different from the main island population. This founder effect is actually very evident in the Amish and Mennonite communities in the U.S., in which po people rarely leave or marry outside their communities. The Old Order Amish actually has a high frequency of six-finger dwarfism. All descendants that have six fingers can actually trace their ancestry back to the very first founder group of the Old Order Amish. Another extreme example of genetic drift is called the bottleneck effect. This happens when a population declines to a very low number due to a catastrophic event called the bottleneck, and then the population eventually rebounds. Uh, you can see here that the gene pool of the rebound population is often very similar to the population that started after the catastrophic event. So we can see here that our parent population started out with uh, some red individuals, some yellow, and some blue individuals. After the bottleneck, or the catastrophic event, we can see that none of the red individuals survived and fewer of the yellow individuals survived, while many blues still did. Thus, as these surviving individuals reproduce over time, the result is that the later generations were much more similar to the genetics of that surviving population. As we can see here, a catastrophic bottleneck event actually causes decreased variation um, within a population. Researchers think that cheetahs in Africa experienced a bottleneck 10,000 years ago, and then another one about 100 years ago. Throughout their current range of um, where they live, cheetahs are so genetically similar that they actually appear to be inbred. Inbreeding decreases fertility, and this factor might result in the potential extinction of this endangered species, since cheetahs have a huge difficulty re reproducing now. So if genetic drift occurs, the population cannot be in Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium. Another way in which genetic equilibrium can be disturbed is by gene flow. In a closed system, no new genes can enter the population and no genes can leave the population. However, very few populations are entirely isolated. At time one, genes in population one um, are all red and genes in population two are all blue. Um, however, at time two, you can see that some of the individuals move between each population, which causes m more variation in each population. Some are blue, some are red. However, this does result in a decrease in the difference between the two populations. The two populations will actually become more similar. Gene flow can happen in two ways. Some individuals can leave, this is called emigration, and some individuals can arrive, this is called immigration. Both will cause gene flow. An example of gene flow is when U.S. soldiers went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Some soldiers had children with, um, women, with the Vietnamese women there, which caused more variation in Vietnam, but causes the Vietnam, Vietnamese population to become more similar to the U.S. population. Gene flow will cause the population to not be in Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium. Another condition that can disturb genetic equilibrium is non-random mating. Uh, with these bugs, random mating results in several different types of offspring. However, rarely do organisms randomly mate in a population. Usually, organisms will mate with individuals in close proximity or those who are very similar, as seen with this bug right here, which ends up creating um, offspring that are less varied. However, this can actually promote inbreeding and can lead to changes in allelic proportions that favor individuals who are homozygous, whether dominant or recessive for particular traits. So for example, purebred dogs are actually very inbred, since breeders want to keep the same breeds for one breed. These purebred dogs are significantly more at risk for diseases um, than mutts, because there's less variation between purebred dogs. Non-random mating will cause a population to not be in Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium. The fourth condition of Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium is that there are no mutations in a population. Therefore, mutations are actually the fourth um, mechanism of evolution. Mutations are the random change in genetic material. You already know this. Um, as these mutations add up in a population, this can actually cause changes in allelic frequencies and thus violates genetic equilibrium. Remember that mutations can be harmful, um, they can be neutral, most are neutral, and some can actually be advantageous. This mutation, an advantageous one, will be selected for through natural selection and thus becomes more common in later generations. Therefore, mutations are actually the raw material on which natural selection works. Without mutations, there's no variation, which means that there's no natural selection and therefore no evolution. 
Don't forget, however, that natural selection only works on the variations that you can see, which is called the phenotype, while we do need mutations, which are a part of the genotype. But um, natural selection only works on the phenotype. An example of a genetic mutation that is advantageous is that of sickle cell anemia. Um, in sickle cell anemia, uh, if you're homozygous recessive, you end up having extreme pain, you can end up in death. However, sickle cell, the sickle cell allele, nevertheless, is in people that lived in Africa. The reason it evolved is because malaria is very prevalent in Africa. A person who is heterozygous, meaning that they have one sickle cell allele and one healthy allele, is more tolerant to a malarial infection, as you can see here. Um, thus, a person that is heterozygous sickle cell carrier has a higher fitness than either a homozygous dominant healthy person who can actually die from a malarial infection. They're also healthier than a higher than um, a homozygous recessive sickle cell sufferer who can die from sickle cell complications. Thus, sickle cell carriers have an advantageous genetic mutation. Keep in mind that genetic mutations cause a population not to be in Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium. The last mechanism of evolution that violates Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium is natural selection, which we've already learned about. Remember that natural selection is the only one of these mechanisms, of these five mechanisms, that actually results in advantageous adaptations, which means that over time, individuals with higher fitness will spread their genes more across a population. For example, Darwin's finches show that on different islands um, where different foods are abundant, the finches' beaks have actually um, evolved over time through natural selection in order to be specialized with whichever foods are abundant. Okay, I want to clear up a misconception at this point. Please remember that an adaptation is any change in a trait that is advantageous and can be passed on to offspring. All right, so they can go to offspring. This actually drives natural selection. So for example, tall giraffes have tall babies. Tallness is something that can be passed on. On the other hand, acclimatization is a change that increases the function of an individual but can't be passed on. So examples of acclimatization is um, exercise, eating healthy, learning not to do stupid things, which results in humans surviving longer throughout their lifetimes. But these things cannot be passed on to our children. Again, natural selection deals with adaptation and not acclimatization. So here are the things that you should know. You should know genetic equilibrium and how it is related to the Hardy-Weinberg principle. You should know the five conditions needed for the Hardy-Weinberg principle, um, which are there should be a large enough population that there is no genetic drift, there is no gene flow, there is no mutations, there is random mating, and there is no natural selection. You should know what an allele is and how um, dominant alleles have not completely wiped out the recessive alleles. You should remember that the opposites of the conditions needed for the Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium are called the five mechanisms of evolution, um, which these are genetic drift, gene flow, um, non-random mating, natural selection, and mutations. You should know the two ways in which populations can get small enough for genetic drift to happen, the founder effect and the bottleneck. Um, you should know the examples of each of these types of genetic drift. You should know the difference between emigration and immigration um, and how these are related to gene flow, as well as you should know an example of gene flow. You should know how non-random mating can actually lead to inbreeding, and you should know an example of this. You should know what a mutation is, as well as what an advantageous mutation example is. You should know how mutations are the raw material by which natural selection actually works. Um, because we need variations for natural selection. You should know the difference between an adaptation caused by natural selection and an acclimatization, which is just of an individual throughout its life. All right, so that is the end. Don't forget to check my digital portfolio for the script for this video if you are someone that likes to learn by reading. See you in class.